as a way of introducing this talk, I want to show you a moment of video from a TED talk um, that our next guest gave. Um, you are really depriving yourself if you don't at your first free moment go and watch the full TED talk of my guest and friend, John Hunter. Um, but I, to, as a way of introducing it, uh, you know, you switched on, okay, I'm going to play just five minutes from that TED talk because I think it sort of sets up who John is. And um, in this talk, he's talking about, uh, I will say a little bit of an introduction. John is a fourth grade teacher. He has been for um, 30 years, right? 40 years, 40 years. wow. Um, <laughs> and uh, he has been, for, for about that long, he's been playing a game called the World Peace Game. That's what he spoke about in the TED Talk. And so I'm just going to show you the little bit of the talk where he describes the game. And then we're going to talk about it here. So let's see if this goes. It's an amazing I need the audio from, you have the audio here? And so I'm here standing on the shoulders of many people. I'm not here alone. There are many people on this stage right now. And so, this world peace game I'd like to tell you about. And five a little higher. It started out like this. It's just a four foot by five foot plywood board in the inner city urban school, 1978. I was uh, creating a lesson for students on Africa. We put all the problems of the world there, and I thought, let's let them solve it. I didn't want to lecture or have just book reading. I wanted to have them be immersed and learn the feeling of learning through their bodies. So I thought, well, I'd like to play games. I'll make something, I didn't say interactive, we didn't have that term in 1978, but something interactive. And so we made the game, and it has since evolved to a four foot by four foot by four foot plexiglass structure, and it has four plexiglass layers. There's an outer space layer with black holes and satellites and research satellites and asteroid mining. There's an air and space level with clouds, uh, big puffs of cotton we push around, and territorial airspaces and air forces, a ground and sea level with thousands of game pieces on it, even an undersea level with submarines and undersea mining. There are four countries around the board. The kids make up the names of their countries. Some are rich, some are poor. They have different assets, commercial and military. Each country has a cabinet. There's a prime minister, secretary of state, minister of defense, and a CFO or comptroller. I choose the prime minister based on my relationship with them. I offer them the job, they can turn it down. And then they choose their own cabinet. There's a World Bank, arms dealers, and a United Nations. There's also a weather goddess who controls a random stock market and random weather. <laughs> That's not all. And then there's a 13-page crisis document with 50 interlocking problems so that if one thing changes, everything else changes. I throw them into this complex matrix, and they trust me because we have a deep, rich relationship together. We have, uh, let's see, ethnic and minority tensions. We have chemical and nuclear spills, nuclear proliferation. There's oil spills, uh, environmental disasters, water rights disputes, breakaway republics, famine, endangered species, and global warming. If Al Gore is here, I'm going to send my fourth graders from Agner Heard and Venable School to you because they saw global warming in a week. <laughs> so I'll stop there. So. so. <laughs> You having fun? Still? Having a great time. Yeah. yeah. So um, the reason that John and I have, have gotten to know each other is that we're talking about trying to figure out a way of um, letting the world peace game go bigger, letting, giving other people access to it. It's actually um, John, I don't know if you know, John was the one who asked uh, Paul the legacy question about how do, we, how do you pass this on? And I think we're trying to help figure out how we can let the world peace game sort of uh, proliferate. So tell me, can you tell us a little bit about what's happening now around the world? You mentioned. Uh, yeah, the, the uh, film came out in 2006, this documentary that the, the game was uh, in. And 2010, it went to South by Southwest and it went to the Bergen International Film Festival. Chris Farina, the filmmaker, and I are just two small town guys from Charlottesville, Virginia, home of Thomas Jefferson and the Dave Matthews Band. And, uh, <laughs> And at the end of the film festival circuit that year, we, we had no money. We were just invited here or there on somebody else's dime. The Martin Institute for Teaching Excellence in Memphis, Tennessee, Jamie Baker, the executive director, 
saw the, t the film, which led to the TED Talk, and said, we need to make a partnership with these guys. And so they brought us on board and basically allowed me to create what's called a master class. And that is where teachers from all over the world now come, or I go to them. We spend two days or five days basically watching the World Peace Game be played live with 30 kids from all over the world. And the teachers will uh, debrief and deconstruct after the game's uh, session is over that morning, understanding the DNA and the mechanics of how it works. But even in a deeper way, there's a, a deeper subtext. We're talking about ways of thinking, seeing, and allowing. And I heard our magician friend talk about basically creating opportunities for epiphany and resetting, constant resetting, because the teacher does not know what is going to happen. I have no control over the situation. It's completely out of my control, but because we have a relationship, there's a trust in the room, they will go into despair because I told them it was safe, and they believe and trust that we can go together. Yeah. So you, uh, one, of the, one of the things I love in your stories is about the games that right up until the very end, yeah. you're sure are going to fail. <laughs> And um, is it, it, when did you realize, uh, the first time that happened, how did you decide to let go and let the game, you thought it was going to fail, of course, uh, so the secret is that they, they never do, but how did you get over that first hump when you thought, were sure the game was going to fail? I don't think I have yet, actually. <laughs> uh, I, I have a dirty little secret, Scott, I'll admit. Every time we play this game, we've been playing for 40 years. Uh, with kids I've just met and kids I've known for some time. I'm afraid. I'm fearful every time we go into that room because I know I have no control beyond our relationship. I can ask questions maybe to help look at consequences, but I can't stop them. They have to be completely human and they have to fail. The game is designed to fail massively and they have to in order to learn how to. I guess in our world today we're not really instructing kids or helping kids learn or allowing them the opportunity to learn how to fail and to deal with it. We want them to know how to succeed and to deal with it, but we don't look at that other half of life, that other part of life. So this allows it to happen, and I, I simply have to stand by and, and hold my own hand and hope that they get through it. Someday they may lose. They may not save the world. So far they have. But that's the, the, the freedom I have as a teacher to let go and the trust I have that they will be able to do this. And you know, you tell a student sometimes, I think you can, and suddenly they can, whereas before they thought they could not. Just that simple little extension of confidence makes all the difference sometimes. And so they continually reset in failure and hopefully come to some creative, collaborative solution for themselves that works beyond my control. What's the... What do you see as the, I mean, now that you've been trying to, to, you've been training other teachers in doing it, I know you have some successes, but what do you see as the biggest impediments to other teachers uh, using the game? Well, and that's, that's why I think we met, actually. Yeah. We, we found traditional classrooms, uh, teachers in my own public school system, I'm a public school teacher, love the idea, love the game, love the learning, the critical and creative thinking that it inspired and facilitated, but couldn't do it had no time and no support. There was no, as one supervisor told me, we couldn't get enough quantifiable data out of it for our standards that we could use, so please put it away. And I resigned and went to another school. But uh, that kind of, I had to. When you know it's wrong for children, you simply can't do it. But that's been the difficulty, is that it takes so much to do in, in the traditional way that I've been doing, which is in the center of a classroom for eight to 10 weeks. So I, I appealed to Scott, or I met Scott, and uh, can I say the company? Yeah. The Learning yeah. Games Network yeah. company that Scott's affiliated with here in, in uh, Boston. And they really got it. We've been approached, Chris and I, right after the TED Talk, by 10, 15 different gaming companies. We want to gamify. We want to make this thing so everybody can use it. We want to put it on a smartphone so they can play with hundreds of other people all the time. And we said, that's not what we want to do. This game will probably be the only game that's not on the internet, not on a video game, deliberately. And as I learned earlier, there's nothing wrong with having a book on a couch or an app on a couch. It's the question of what is the involvement and engagement. I'm learning a lot from this guy already. I just got here. <laughs> but that kind of openness and understanding allows us to explore the possibility of scaling this out so that other teachers can somehow have access to build their own physical model play with their own students and community 
and be in communication with other games that are physically being played around the world. We have it informally now, but I think Scott's model will be able to accelerate that whole process for us. So, so tell me about what you've got informally now. What's going on right now around the world? Uh, we've got 15 teams, 15 games being played around the world. Teachers who came to me, about 1,000 have come in the last two years. They've trained for the two-day or five-day period. It's exhausting. It's intense. We intentionally push the teachers, as the students are, into the unknown, where they don't know the right answer. And we also ask them to create or develop their own best curriculum after influence with the game that has ever been seen before. So they leave our session with not only the World Peace Game DNA, but um, work that they have dug deep within themselves and vetted in a room full of other master teachers and built a beautiful piece of curriculum. They leave with that. So these 15 teachers, I think, from Seattle to Dallas and San Diego to Milwaukee, Boston, Nashville, uh, Bergen, Norway, and uh, I'll be going to uh, Vienna, Austria in April to play with 30 uh, students in German. I've been invited to play in Shanghai in Ma Mandarin, which I don't speak, but it's going to be very interesting. So there's sort of a spread going on informally, but I'm only one person. And it's originating out of my head. And I know I don't have that much time. We don't know how, long, how much time we do have. So I've got to work as quickly as possible to, as I said, get this legacy out, to share this with with as many people as can have it. And of course, the teachers who have it now immediately mutate, which I think is great. That is totally beyond me and my starting point, as it should be. So it can go on without me. And we're trying to do that as quickly as possible. Well, hopefully, we, don't, hopefully we won't have to do it too I'll quickly. I'll as long as I yeah, have it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, with, just out of curiosity, because a lot of the conversation around education now mm. presumes I hate to say it, the teachers are not interested or competent. I mean, you know, think about the debate you read in the papers all the time, how often the presumption is that the teacher is the problem in the mix. How do you feel about the teachers? I mean, just <laughs> you meet and, and, and sort of mm. what, how prepared they are or what they would do if they could or, you know. Mm. So. Well, just based on my own experience, and in, in the last four years, I'd say, since 2010, I've been just on a rocket, rocket ship ride around the world. Uh, I've spoken and met and worked with teachers from, I don't know, dozens of countries, uh, literally hundreds of schools. And I've had a chance to spend time with them. What I have found, and it's so remarkable to me, is contrary to what I see in the news, uh, beyond Skimmer, of course, is an exception. <laughs> beyond what I see in, in mainstream news is that there are so many really exceptionally good teachers everywhere. But if it bleeds, leads, doesn't work in education, you see a disaster story like Waiting for Superman, and we have an assumption that everything's like that. It's going bad everywhere. But I, my experience, to the contrary, in hundreds of schools says that there are so many amazing, I'm talking about astounding professional educators that are unsung, have an entire career we never know what they did, we never hear about it. Exceptional work that we never see. So I'm just sort of trying to bring their story to light, really. I'm a mouthpiece for people who don't get a chance to get a camera in their classroom. That's kind of a purpose. So I'm very optimistic, very hopeful. I mean, our kids have gone to the Pentagon, we've been at the United Nations because of this little game, but imagine all those other teachers who haven't had that shot who are much better than I am. Do you want to say anything in passing about your experience at the Pentagon? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, brief story. Chris Farina and I, the filmmaker, were screening the film in Silicon Valley for a firm called IDEO, a design firm, one of the premier design firms in the world. They said what we were doing was design thinking. We said, yeah, yeah sure it is. Yeah. <laughs> we're doing that all, we do that, yeah, absolutely. And a, a wonderful, beautifully dressed, fant fantastic hair, Italian shoes, really well put together young woman came and handed me a card saying, Ms. Turner, we'd like to see you. The card said, Defense Department, Pentagon. We thought we were in some kind of real serious trouble. <laughs> Chris and I drove to the Pentagon and spent a day there. And they told us they had screened his film, this 56-minute documentary that talks about ways of creating peace and empty spaces so you don't have to react. They screened this film four times. And then they screened it again and talked with us for two hours 
about how to create an empty space so they don't have to react all the time. Here are two small town guys with some of the most powerful military people who've ever lived. And they're asking us, what do we think? I go back to Virginia, my home, and I get a call two weeks later, Mr. Hunter, we'd like for you to bring your children to the Pentagon. The ones who play that game, we want to talk to them about that empty space. So my kids got dressed up. <laughs> And uh, we have fictional countries in the game, but I put them on real world country desks so they could have some, something uh, real world to talk about. And they went and had a mock press briefing and stumped the Pentagon press briefing secretary twice, I'm very proud to say. <laughs> and uh, yes, they did. And uh, we had, of course, the tour. We had uh, pizza with the generals and that kind of thing. But two, three, and four star generals spent from 9 a.m. until noon asking my students questions, having this policy, strategy, and tactics discussions. It was not a warm, fuzzy photo op, a serious, we handle insurgents like this, how do you handle them in the field? <laughs> a surreal experience. And to top it all off, we were ushered into an office, we didn't know this was gonna happen, huge office, and there himself, the Secretary of Defense then, uh, Leon Panetta, who says, I got 10 minutes, boys and girls, I want to talk to you about policy. He took off his coat, he stayed a half an hour. He talked to them about how they handle global warming, about how they handle insurgents in the field, big problem for them. And it was just a surreal experience for me. And at the very end, he reached in his pocket and his assistant came up with a little box and he did something astounding. I have them with me here now too. He gave a special military honor. If anybody here has been in the military before, there's a special thing called coining. It's when a commander is given a coin or strikes a coin in their name and it gives it to a subordinate for some outstanding service above and beyond the call. It's a rare and special thing. He coined every one of those children. Not only that, we come out of his office and there is a general with five stars on his shoulder. He said, Mr. Hunter, yes, World Peace Game delegation. He knew who the kids were. I want to coin you too. I was the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Martin Dempsey. Who, General Martin Dempsey, who asked the children more questions about insurgents and global warming, their top priorities. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know what effect that it has, but it certainly gives you hope and optimism that the most powerful war machine that the world has ever seen is looking for answers everywhere to not do what they do very well. So, well, I mean, I'm a little yeah. bit breathless, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, You know that old line, you know, you had me at hello. Uh, John first had me. <laughs> um, when he told me about his, M his MIT. So I, I, we, we have a little time, right? I can, so I want can you to tell, yeah, about, oh, tell about your great. MIT. You know, I, I heard I want to uh, aspire to inspire, as our magician friend said. So I invented a set of problems for my students to solve, fourth and fifth graders primarily, although I do have third and second graders on them sometimes. I call them the MITs. Mystery, Intuition, and Technology Projects. I want to inspire them a little bit. So these problems are problems that cannot be solved, uh, yet engineers come from our university, nearby University of Virginia sometimes, to see what the kids come up with because they're so astounding. Now the problems are things like, build something that shows me what silence looks like. You have a month to do it. Can't use anything that we normally do. Adults, empty box, blank sheet of paper, a zero. Simple conventional answers. What do these kids do? They come back with a box about so long, so big, it's got a hole in one end. They say, Mr. Hunter, stick your arm in the hole. You'll feel what silence feels like. Nothing will bite you, I promise. So I roll up my sleeve, put my hand in the box, and have this astounding sensation. I have to say, that's what it feels like. Inside the box, they've got flanges of three-inch construction paper, about an inch wide glued all around inside the box to make a sort of channel where your arm can fit through. The edges sticking all into the center. So as your skin goes in, you're touched by these soft little flanges all the way to the back of the box. The back of the box, there's a wad of cotton that your fingertips touch that's soaked in rose water. So as you bring your arm out, you get another sensation too. Now, think about conventional uh, testing. What yeah. Scott was talking about, how do you grade that? <laughs> Is that a B plus, C minus, what is that? <laughs> and one other one I'll close with, and that's yeah. our delay box problem. The delay box is a beautiful, uh, beautiful problem. It's a box, any size, I don't care what size it is, a cardboard box, you put two holes in the box, anywhere you want, one hole here, one hole there. A marble has to be dropped into the hole, 
it has to go through the box and remain in motion while it's in the box for as long as possible and come out the other hole, up to 24 hours. Most adults, myself included, well, we put a little ramp, you know, from the mouse trap game we played as kids in there, five, six seconds, marble comes out. What do these kids do? <sighs> Open the box, a vertical box. There's a pulley stuck in the top of the box, a thread, two Dixie cups, little tiny cups, a couple of ounces. The marble falls in the hole, falls into the first cup. The other cup is at the bottom, it's full of water. It's heavier than this cup, so it just sits there. We look closer, there are pinholes put into the bottom cup, and it's leaking water. And as it gets lighter, 18 minutes later, the marble comes out. It gets better. Should I tell them about the other? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you know, there's no answer. Mr. Hunter, how do you do this? I have no idea. We, ta we have a, oh gosh, this is so great, a box. This custodian's child, a little girl at her school, nobody thought was very smart. She said, can I try it? She wasn't in my class. I said, sure. Comes in with a, a sort of large shoe box. She says, my marble will come out in 23 hours, 59 minutes, and 59 seconds from now. That's the limit, right? 24 hours, Mr. Hunter? Yeah. We put it in, we set the clock, we come back next day, right on time, marble comes out. <laughs> Open the box. Her father's a custodian, underprivileged kid. Her father took one of those big analog clocks you have in elementary schools off the wall. She cut a hole above the 12 in the face of the clock, cut a hole in the side of the rim right at the 12 and connected the two holes. Took the minute hand off, the hour hand off, put the minute hand back on with a popsicle stick glued to the end to make it long enough. The marble drops in the shoe box. She falls just north or just south of the 12 o'clock hole where the minute hand, now taking 12 hours to go around, hits it, takes it around, sweeps it. She puts the second clock underneath and times it so when the marble comes out of the first clock, falls into the face of the second clock, same operation, sweeps again, comes out. 23 hours, 15 hours. Last one. Yeah. Last one. Kids that you don't think can do anything. This one, this box has no gravity feed. It's, it's a horizontal box. She puts the marble on one end. We're all wondering, how is it going to work? No gravity feed. We wait. She says, about 45 minutes or so. What kind of mechanism? She didn't even know how long it's going to take. <laughs> 45, 47 and a half minutes later, the marble comes out. It's sitting in a little bottle cap. The bottle cap essentially is a sled. And so a piece of tape, piece of tape under the sled attached to the back of her pet hermit crab <laughs> that she has, she has trained to go through a maze inside the box looking for food. <laughs> so we outlawed animals. We didn't get in trouble with PETA or anything, so we outlawed <laughs> animals. But that's uh, kind of what those problems are. Basically, we create an opportunity for epiphany, an opportunity for discovery, no instructions. Good luck to you. I'm, I'm glad I'm modeling what our speakers before have done yeah. because that's really from 40 years' experience in the classroom is let go and let the children figure it out, as Scott was saying. So let's take some questions. So. Yeah. Yes, sir. And those kids from the Pentagon. They've yeah. been. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to. Yeah. I mean, the ones with the hermit crab. <laughs> <laughs> Can you describe how you implement the peace game a little bit more detail in your own classroom? You said it was eight weeks, but is it the entire day? And do they have all these resources that they look up after they've received your brief? And um, how, I'm just curious about, you said imaginary countries. Are, there, are they all imaginary? Just sure. some more detail. Uh, since I'm, I'm very fortunate. I'm what's called a pull-out teacher or a specialist. So I get kids from everybody's room once or twice or three times a week. So for this game, we'll play maybe once a week or twice a week, depending on the school's master schedule, what I'm allowed. So this group of fourth graders or fifth graders will come in. I'll see them maybe eight, 10 weeks, uh, sometimes twice a week, sometimes once a week for that amount of time. So I can keep the structure in my room. It's now on caster, so we can wheel it out of the way and do other things, too. Basically, we'll put it in the center of the room and sit around 25 to 30 kids. I have to have a lot of people. Usually we try to get smaller classrooms. I have to have a lot because it has to be chaotic. Kids who are having difficulty with noise, find a way to work with it because it's impossible. Otherwise, there are quiet moments. We read Sun Tzu's The Art of War. We have a quiet moment of reflection after the 
fourth graders or nine-year-olds read that passage and try to understand it. We don't discuss it, we just let it go in. So we'll have fictional countries. We had real world countries, but we found that the students were solving problems. This was decades ago. And they stopped solving problems. I couldn't figure out why. They just couldn't get any more solutions. Solutions never worked. And I overheard a couple of them talking about, well, my mom said in the news they, they were doing this in Egypt. So oh, they were just simply doing what adults did. And they were failing. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we couldn't do it either. So we stripped out the real names, gave them fictional countries based loosely on real world countries. And then we have 50 interlocking, interdependent, real world global problems. I designed so that if one thing changes, everything will be affected, multi, multiple layers of consequences. When they start out, they can only see one immediate effect. I do this, I get that reaction. And of course, it dooms them immediately. And they see it doesn't work. So they start to learn to look more deeply and to see multiple layers of consequence. And that kind of consequential thinking is what I think inspires them further. They develop it as a habit in practice, experientially, in real world setting, where they feel like they're saving the real world. They buy the fiction. They believe they really are saving the world. And some of them have gone on into policy work where they're really trying to do that, which is really gratifying, too. So they're gathered around that structure. Anything can happen. And I don't know what's going to happen. And I'm, they break my heart every time. Because they're allowed to be completely human. They go to war, they have revenge, they're impulsive, but they learn experientially what doesn't work. And they find those things don't work. And they always end up coming to compassion. I have to take care of you because we're interdependent. If you go down, eventually it's going to hurt me too. Kind of a selfish enlightenment in a way, they discover. Yes, sir, you were going first. <laughs> Uh, first, thank you for the inspiring conversation. This is amazing. Uh, I'm not an educator. I'm a parent. How do I get my daughters to experience this? I think you probably are an educator, actually, <laughs> in, in disguise, the Superman kind of thing. <laughs> uh, the World Aspire. Peace game right now is being played physically by me around the world. We're going to be in Menlo Park, California in August, uh, Rutgers, New Jersey in July, and I'm going to be in Vienna, Austria in April. Uh, those are three major physical games where teachers come and students come. But thank goodness for Scott and the Learning Games Network, because I might not have to go everywhere all the time. We have trained teachers who are doing it now in Denver, Seattle, other places across the country. And our website, worldpeacegame.org, will sort of give you links to all that. But um, hopefully teachers will come and start to take it and make it their own. And that's what we really hope will happen. I see Peter Stidwell in the audience, too, from Learning Games Network. He's part of our team now with Scott and making this really possible that you don't need one guy to do this anymore. And we hope that happens really soon so your daughter can have it. Yeah. So the hope, you. just so you, uh, you know, the hope is that if we can find the funding, we'll build out a teacher's site that will mm. empower teachers to feel capable of doing yeah. it for themselves. Um, it can't happen without teachers, A, being willing to do it and having the support of their administrators. So yeah. we hope we'll give them all the ammunition they need to be able to do that. Um, if you want to interest your child, kids, teacher, if, have them watch either the talk or even better yet the film and sort of build a groundswell you know, in your school for it. That would, be a, that would be a powerful thing to do. So, yeah. In your TED Talk, um, I don't know if everybody's going to get to see it, but I had the privilege of seeing your TED Talk. And you told a story about a last minute save of the world. And I would love it if you would tell that story to this group. Yeah. Uh, sure. Thank you, Marcy. There, there are a lot of stories. Actually, there's a book, World Peace and Other Fourth Grade Achievements, which is also the name of the documentary Chris Farina made. Uh, but one of the stories I share in the book, it's not in the film, it's about a team that played for about seven weeks. Uh, we had been relegated to after school because the principal couldn't get quantifiable data. I was later on my way out the door at that point. I didn't realize it. But we were after school, and the kids had come. They'd throw their backpacks against the wall and gather around this thing and play for about an hour and a half. And then the parents would come and pick them up. Four o'clock sharp. There's no delays. Parents would come, and they would be gone. So we had almost won the game. They had solved all 50 of those interlocking problems. But the other goal in the game is every country's asset value must be increased. In other words, there can be no losers. If we're losing, somebody's losing, we continue playing. We're interdependent. So Everybody has to survive and do well. Well, there was one country that had made bad deals, had multiple tsunamis, had everything go wrong. 
there was no way we could win. There was something like $600 billion in debt. It was just impossible. We had reached the last day of the game. The principal was going to cut it off. The parents were outside the door. You could see them in the glass window waiting for the 4 o'clock to pick them up and take them away. And we had about two minutes left, and we were going to lose the game. First time in history, 35 years at that point, the game had been lost. I felt terrible for putting these kids in that situation. I had made a game that was chaotic, and chaos was supposed to be the rule, and yet here it was. It was going to scar them forever. <laughs> I could not interfere. I couldn't just say, well, we're going to make some magic formula and wave our wand. It's all going to be good so we can win. Not possible by my own rules. So Brennan was in the room. Brennan is now an, an, an analyst in Baltimore city government uh, looking for crime and corruption. And he gave a TED talk himself uh, a couple of months ago, actually. So very proud of Brennan. Brennan was there. He was 10. And he was always in trouble. Uh, that's why I love Brennan. And uh, Brennan after the announcement was made by the weather goddess that, we were, that this country was $600 million in debt and wasn't going to come up anytime soon, a sort of gloom and despair fell over the entire room. I didn't know what to do. Nobody knew what to do. And suddenly, Brennan walks over to my chair, and he grabs a little bell that I ring. I ring a little bell to signal different changes of sessions. And he, everybody ran to his chair. I said, well, that's the only job I had, and he took that away. And, <laughs> I didn't know what was going on, though, and there was a heated discussion. I remember yelling and screaming. Documents and dossiers, a 30-page dossier, the 13-page crisis document waved in the air in this scrum of kids, and I'd lost complete control of my classroom. I, I have no idea what's going on. If the principal comes in now, she will fire me on the spot, you know, not even wait for the game to end. So Brendan rings the bell again, and there's about 30 seconds left at this point. You know, I'm ready to cry. And Brennan stands up and breathlessly tells everybody, we've come to a, a decision. We've collected enough funds through donations and grants from all the other parties. And we got a donation of $610 billion to give this country a bill, except we accept it. And the prime minister of that country who was in the scrum doesn't really know what's going on these days. He's, yeah. <laughs> Five seconds, three seconds left. And the weather goddess declares the game won. And there's pandemonium. Kids are rolling on the floor screaming and laughing, and it's euphoria. It's complete euphoria. Now, the thing is, adults would have figured this out a long time ago. Sure, collect money for a donation, no big deal. But the kids didn't know that. They didn't understand that. They had no clue for that. They had to invent it under pressure, on the spot. And they iterate a lot of things, or reiterate a lot of things we've done that are good, but under pressure because they need to survive. So that was the story of Brennan, and I'm so proud that they did it themselves. They do it differently than I would every time, and I'm always wrong when I try to guess what they're going to do. Well, so we're, we, I think we're out of time, right? Is that what your, that was not what your signal said? Yeah, okay. Well, thanks very much. So we're around. So.